Hi everyone, welcome to another uh, Transcendence podcast. My name is Corey Bradford Watts and I'm with John Gwynn. John Gwynn. Yeah. Hello. And uh, <laughs> how are you today, John? I'm good. Thank you for um, the visit and the opportunity to share some of my spiritual journey. Yeah, that's wonderful that you agreed to be on and it's uh, nice to catch up and, and hear about uh your, your spiritual work. I, I've always found uh, your, your viewpoint, your uh, like in-depth uh, walk with uh, reflection and spirituality to be inspiring. Thank so, you. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So, how are you feeling today? What's, what's going on? Well, um, this is a first for me, and uh, so I'm a little... Um, it's just completely new and going to be a new experience and uh, a little little nervous, so we'll see. Understandable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I know you through the San Francisco Swedenborgian Church, for the most part. Uh, but we've also connected, um, talking about, well, besides, you know, uh, everyday things, uh, your Gurdjieff work. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about who Gurdjieff was and, and what is Gurdjieff? work? Well, I've been um, involved in the what's known as the work from the early 20th century mystic uh, Gurdjieff or Gurdjieff for about 20 years, um, a little break in there somewhere. And it's basically a known as a fourth way school Fourth way. Fourth way, uh, meaning like it's not just the school of the, it's, it's, a, it's a school in life, so we're meant to uh, take our efforts into life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not purely the way of the yogi or the mind, the way of the, of the um, monk or the way of the heart or the way of the physical mortification, the fakir, but it's, it's a concurrent work in opening on the body, the mind, mm -hmm. and the heart. So all so facets. All of, facets. So when you get to the, you, know, you start in the basement, and when you get to the attic, you, um, you, the heart, the mind, and the body are more related. And the basic premise of the work is that we are asleep in this life, all of us, and we do not know it. Hmm. And therefore, we need to learn how to see ourselves, to see our sleep, and see ourselves as we actually are, and that is the beginning of a, hmm. of a work of transformation. That's the beginning, the realizing beginning. that we... Realizing, and that's a long work, it's just in itself, that little beginning step to see that we're asleep, to truly know how asleep we are. It's like the first day of creation light appears and yeah. you can start processing. Like that, yeah. Uh, it seems it's, like... It's always ahead. something we always return to, though. Um, the depth of our sleep... So after 20 years, the depth of my sleep is ever and ever more astounding. So, mm -hmm. But what's interesting is it's not a negative work. It's, oh, I'm just asleep and therefore hopeless. It's a, when I truly begin to learn how to see myself, these moments of seeing are hopeful, expanding, enlightening moments. Well, I mentioned the creation story because, um, at least for most Swedenborgians, they view uh, that story as well as most, of, if not all of scripture, as a symbolic, uh, you know, uh, narrative about how we grow or um, relate with each other and God. Um, and it seems like Gurdjieff or Gurdjieff work uh, also kind of focuses on the idea that transformation, internal transformation, is kind of the name of the game. It is, and um, I'd say the uh, hmm. important part is that you begin to develop a, a conscious and intentional relation to your state, to your possibilities, and to this transformation. Repeat that. Uh, a conscious and intentional relation conscious and intentional. to your state, hmm. to your condition, and to your possibilities and and to the, this process in Swedenborgianism of regeneration. In yeah. fact, you know, I took a class with Jim Lawrence many years ago. At the dean at the Center for Swedenborgian yes. Studies. At the at, at that time it was yeah this right and it was um 
it was it was a whole semester or a quarter on uh, Genesis chapter one as a guide for spiritual regeneration from the beginning to the end of a life. Oh really? Yeah. Cool. We just did the whole just chapter one, whatever, eight, ten, twelve weeks on that. So went in depth in terms of its uh, metaphorical and narrative and as, um, as the stages of regeneration. Huh. And regeneration as kind of the transformation of the human mind and will, or I would say from the, from the from the birth as an animal to the full human potential. Huh. And I, I mean, as I remember in the course, chapter one, Genesis chapter one does that, and the whole Bible does that too, from Genesis chapter one through the descent of the New Jerusalem. So um, you could view all of biblical scripture that way as an esoteric guide to the hmm. spiritual life huh. of well, the human being. That seems like it could be pretty powerful. Was mm -hmm. that was that informative for you? Was that a good approach? Is that a good approach for you? I found the course um, it was a transformative moment in my spiritual growth was to, to take that course and okay. to see the and to learn to truly see the Bible that way and and to be freed from um, fundamental and uh, literal meanings of the Bible and to hmm. take almost every every phrase, every scripture, every part as a esoteric um, direct inner esoteric direction and guidance or the possibility of such. Um, hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I think most people who read the Bible um, do that to some degree, whether they know it or not. They, we look right. at these stories and we say, okay, well, we can relate to this even just within ourselves, you know, right. these char these different characters are kind of, this one's kind of like me when here, and this mm -hmm. is kind of like this other part of me, and, and what can we learn from that story? Um, hmm. Well, even all these, you know, Old Testament scriptures that are uh, talking about these warring nations and enemies and everything. Yeah. And that make, that make, that if you take it externally, it can make life look so horrible and warlike. But if you take it innerly, you, you can admit that it really is a picture of the inner life and, and, the, cha and the struggles and the oppositions and the possibilities of... Um, yeah. It's yeah. much more helpful for me than to look at it as a, some pseudo-history of, mm -hmm. of uh, the Jewish nation or the Christian path or the Christian history or something. Well, definitely, at least according to most uh, scholars, it's a simplified history of, mm -hmm. in some way. And um, yeah, it's it's interesting because it, it is problematic. The the stories, at least I believe it is, stories of you know genocide almost, mm -hmm. like go kill all the Canaanites or whatever. Right. Um, and I think it does. It, you can kind of it doesn't get rid of the problems in that literal version of and and mm -hmm. there's other issues throughout biblical scripture as well as other right. scripture but I think the metaphor acknowledging the, the issues the metaphor of those stories can still mm -hmm. deeply speak to us right. they might have even been crafted, crafted to do so you know when I think of the um, so I have three basic spiritual things I'm involved with um, I'd say my primary practice is the Gurdjieff work also known as the work mm -hmm. Um, the church, the Swedenborgian church, which I'm involved with in San Francisco, and Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, yeah. And having had a particularly challenging early life due to... This is my, my experience. My way of... Alcoholism for me was a way of being that was so fraught with pain and um, denial and um, not accepting life on life's terms that it led to a compulsion to medicate, uh -huh. an inexorable compulsion to medicate, not, an, not excusing it as a, you know, it's not self-medication in the simple sense like a one cocktail, but an actual inexorable compulsion to become obliterated. Life was so difficult that you... The life that I created internally was so did. difficult. Huh. And so, That's now right. when I look at old scripture readings, Old Testament reading, excuse me, which most people these days, in my opinion, tend to dislike because it's so hammer-wielding and 
negative and Seems death and sometimes. battles and <laughs> yeah. and you will and I will destroy this nation and yeah the judgeful the judgmental judgment. God. When I read it now, I just feel like God. he's giving us the answer. It's just it's 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 simple. He's just saying, you follow my my direction and you will live a happy life. You 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 battle me and you will die. And, and <laughs> seems like the the general theme of a lot of those stories. Right, right? and <laughs> and now I get when many of us hear a script, uh, hear a hymn that we really enjoy, we have that f opening, that lovely feeling inside of opening of the heart and feeling. Yeah, I get I, with a beautiful hymn, let's say, just for, for expl explanation. With sake. music. And, right. Yeah. It speaks I get that deep of a feeling when I hear hammer wielding scripture now. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. Because it speaks I, to you. Because the, I just simply see without the Oh, I don't like that. It's too negative. It's too, it's too judgmental. It's an angry God. I want a, I want a sweet God. I don't want an angry God. So I don't like those scriptures. Well, often I, that's all we huh? know of those scriptures. Right. Like we don't know to read it any deeper than that. Right. right. And yeah. so now when I hear it, I hear the, tr I feel the, the truth of it. Like, and to the point of it's almost like, oh my God. It, in Old Testament, he's just giving us the answer. It's like, it's almost so literal, it's like being offered to us on a plate. Hmm. Like, mm -hmm. so, I, so I'm not sure how I got there from your question, but. Well, no, yeah. that's, that's perfect. Actually, so you mentioned that class, the, the Genesis class with right. Jim Lawrence is kind of being a transformational moment with you right. and in connection to scripture. Right. And I should mention that uh, we're affiliated with the Center for Swedenborgian Studies, the Transcendence Podcast as well as the uh, Swedenborg Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks for letting me do that okay. little aside. But I think what you're saying is, is really powerful for, well, for me at mm -hmm. least, um, that looking at scripture as this internal narrative that um, helps us look within and, right. and try to change and, and may even help us think about what to change. Or How do you think about that? Well, and Today, when I read scripture or other deeper spiritual readings, it's not so much, what does this mean? What is, what is this telling me? You know, um, hmm. Could I get a deeper spiritual understanding of this? Of course, there is that element. It's, it's, a, it's a, the natural way the mind works. Mm -hmm. It's the function of the mind to want to understand things that way. But what I truly get out of my studies now is what it's asking of me. What you get is what, what is. Whatever is in front of me, be it a scripture or something from the Gurdjieff work or a Buddhist reading or a Buddhist Dharma reading or whatever it is I'm reading. In addition to the huh. usual, which is, oh, can I understand what the author's saying on whatever level, the more important thing I get from it is what is it asking of me? Hmm. Like, about my levels of consciousness or kindness or love or hate or fear or do you have so, an example that you can that you can think of well it's, i'm really kind of talking about revelation it's kind of hard yeah. to make it that's a tough it's a tough one but i'm <laughs> there's a lamb with seven eyes and yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's more about I'm, I'm doing an ordinary study but the real interesting thing that comes to me is I begin to experience just, um, oh my God, I'm really not a very kind person. Huh. Or, really? or or just the lack in my... That, you you, know, you get sound, insight into I get your, insight into me yeah. when I'm reading it. That's like, um, like that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, I tend to focus on the negative, but that's not really it. It's For me, these things aren't negative. A true moment of seeing... Is a free mo is a free moment. No matter, we can see. Most of us could probably write a good two-page essay on what we're like. I tend to be a little defensive and fearful with other people, and I'm kind of shy at times. And I'm, but I'm open-minded and um, and um, you know, gregarious when I'm with people I love. And I had a problem with my father, and my mother and I were better friends. And this is what I'm like. And you could write a pretty accurate essay. That's not seen. That's not seen. It's not seen. Mm -hmm. um, What's seen? Seen, let's just say, I'm, 
for some reason I'm more present to myself during a study or in life and I begin to see, just for simplicity's sake, the depth of some character trait. And just for, to make the example more clear, it's a negative one like uh, my selfishness. And I begin to see truly, truly how selfish I am. Yeah, I can be quite selfish too. <laughs> and it's, um, in the ordinary way of writing that essay I was talking about, it's going to be a discouraging negative experience. Mm. But in a true seen way, I'm free when I see it. I'm freed when I see it. I f mm. the, the feeling that arises is one of expansive feeling of hopefulness and freedom. And, um, and, um, because you've finally noticed it? You've, no, finally, <laughs> you've, no, you've seen it in a different you're way. It. You're seeing yeah. it in a different way. Maybe mm. you're seeing it and being seen. Um, and you're present to this, to this phenomena of seeing and being seen. There's light being shed on something that you usually hide away. Or you, Even you don't the, really acknowledge exists, right? Yeah, and you don't... And like in the Gurdjieff work, you haven't known how to look for it. And you begin to, hmm. you begin to, your wish, beca your true wish begin, be begins to evolve that you truly want to see these things. And it's counterintuitive to a lot of people because, because of the pain they experience in their ordinary way of experiencing these things. There's a lot of pain when you uh, yeah. are ashamed, accidentally ashamed of what you've done or when how you, you get behave. very offensive often, yeah, right? right? We don't want to hear any type of Right. critique let alone explore it ourselves and shine a spotlight on it often we we seem to just project those like the critique that we intuitively know about ourselves mm -hmm. we tend to project towards other people right right <laughs> yeah. and including the things we don't know but are there anyways oh yeah, yeah. definitely mm -hmm. those things mm -hmm. in fact if you're i find that if i'm really vehement about a certain type of judgment towards mm -hmm. another person it's definitely has something to do with me. <laughs> right. just, it's know. very interesting. This 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 work on ourselves is so subtle. And let me be clear. I say this work on ourselves, but in Christian terms, it has to be recognized. It has to be a humble work, which is one of my biggest. In, the lack of humility is one of my largest character traits. But is it? <laughs> I mean, but. You know, I'm not talking about my interactions with others necessarily, but with my strivings for inner perfection and huh. their... Well, you find your strivings are lack humility? I, f I think, I don't want to claim to understand myself that well, but I think sure. because <laughs> of a challenged childhood where things weren't going to be all right, hmm. I've developed a way of being, even in faith, even in with great um, healing and, and a greater faith and sobriety and, and um, intensive ongoing spiritual work that in the most ordinary way, something in me doesn't believe things will be all right unless there's a certain level of success. And that's not an external level to look good in front of others. I'm not talking about that. Sure. But there's some criteria for performance. You hold yourself to a high standard, it sounds like, right? Well, it, yeah, I would say it does. It does. It does. That um, I does. do too, but it does. <laughs> That's a good, yeah. that kind of creates some distance between that right. habit and what you identify as yourself. So even in my spiritual work, it plays a role, like that same striving for performance is mm. even in my spiritual work. So it's a subtle thing, you know. I can only be what I can be, though, and I can only do as good as I can. I can only, I'm only going to do what I do and be what I am and hmm. at whatever level I'm at, you know. Do you try to watch yourself in this work, like kind of almost like a third party? Or That's the, one of the, so the premise of the work is that we're asleep and we don't know it, that we need to learn to see ourselves, that we, we ascribe a consciousness to ourselves that we don't have. Oh, really? Just because we're awake and, and seeing the outside world and supposedly thinking we ascribe a consciousness to ourselves that we don't actually have huh. and um, huh. and Can you say more about well that? I was, let me I was going to answer I was going to sort of go towards Please. your last question yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so um, and I don't claim to represent the Gurdjieff work at all and I'm sort of speaking extemporaneously here but uh, 
You're sharing your it, your my opinion, yeah. my experience. But um, one of the premises of the work is that we remember ourselves, and that our impressions of ourselves and of the world and life can be food for spiritual growth, literal alchemical food for transformation hmm. and the building of higher being bodies or the soul as is different parts of the soul let's say the more eternal soul hmm. um, but only if we rem are remembering ourselves that means we're actively and consciously somehow aware of the impression and and very acutely aware of our existence and of ourselves being aware of the impression. So we're having an impression and we're aware of ourselves having the impression. It's like, a, like I'm, I'm present, I'm here, and I'm aware of myself having an impression. It mm. could be of my inner tra character traits or my way of being or of the beauty of a tree or, or some intimate moment with a friend or a loved one. Any moment. You're like you're aware. You're aware. And if right, and if I'm not aware that I'm aware, there's no possibility in that moment. So uh, is that? Go ahead. It just the impression goes away. It goes is is stays on a mechanical level, a level of the maintenance of the factory, the machine. Hmm. So there's three types of food. There's um, air, water, and solid food, and impressions. Okay. And we could live for, you know, like two minutes without air, several weeks or months without water or food, less without water, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But we would die instantly if we had no impressions. We would some would say, "Oh, I'd be dead." Oh, you of course you'd have no impressions because you're dead, but this is actually saying if there was a if there was a cessation of the influx of impressions, you'd be dead hmm. quicker than with air or water. But these impressions, so we're a machine, we all could relate to this metaphor analogy, we're a machine, a, an animal, an organism, mm -hmm. that has requirements of air, water, food, and impressions to be alive. And to a certain degree, it all happens mechanically to, to fulfill the needs of Mother Nature, and the Earth, and the stars, and the moon. Well, yeah, and some of us believe the brain is more mechanical than others, right? Right. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, we're dig I'm digressing, but you begin to learn that there's different levels of thinking and the levels of thinking, even the most f highly academic philosophical levels can be quite mechanical compared to other levels of thinking that you can begin to experience. Hmm. Um, but it's not the same thing. It's, they're not the same. They're, not app they're apples and oranges, really. There's really? different levels of thinking. But So this machine is fed by, by air, food and water and impressions. And if we're not remembering ourselves, it's all just to maintain the factory. And after a certain age, the factory dies and becomes dust. And new factories are little, new little baby factories are born and live their lives and die. Hmm. But if you remember yourself, the factory can, can be, begin to be built in a different way. If you remember yourself, these impressions become food for transformation and higher levels of the factory, more rooms, more hallways. And these aren't words that are used in the work. I'm just making a simple oh, that's analogy. Fascinating. Yeah, it's a very alchemical thing, actually. Alchemical uh, in the oldest sense of the, of the world, of that sort of way. Alchemical, as in, um, there's different and higher levels of substance being built and growing within you during spiritual transformation than the ones we know about with about microscopes and chemical tests and. Oh. So, so it's like a, you're building something real. Something real. You may not be able to test, you right. know, measure it on this plane. Right. Perhaps. Okay. Right. Hmm. So. Huh. And but so remembering yourself is a very important part of uh, the work. And of course, what you see is that you can't remember. And the, ironically, Gurdjieff gave us an admonition: remember yourself always and everywhere. But if you remembered yourself always and everywhere, you'd be there. <laughs> you'd be awake. Mm -hmm. Everything would be food for spiritual growth. You'd be alive to your life and present and filled with the Holy Spirit. And so 
remember yourself, huh. but all you can really see is that you don't remember yourself. But if you see that you can't remember yourself, you're actually kind of beginning to remember yourself. It's, you're in the process yes. of remember, trying to remember yourself. Yeah. Doing so, better. So if you experience the fact that you're asleep, you've actually, if you're experiencing the fact that you're asleep, then you're seeing something, you're a little more awake. That's true. Yeah. So. If you realize you're in machination, as mm -hmm. it maybe Gurdjieff might put it, then you you start to work out of the machination. And we talk about three things in the work. And of course, just like in Christianity, everything is but of, by, and for the Lord, or done by something higher. And, and all our ordinary ways of thinking and doing. Because um, you consider yourself a Swedenborgian Christian? Yeah, I consider myself a or what? Swedenborgian, but I don't consider in, in, um, in accordance with some work ideas, I don't consider Christianity to be possible without a deeper inner work. Mm -hmm. So I feel like what I bring from the work enhances my ability to be open to worship and scripture and the Christian message. Now, not all... But the, Sweden, but the work message is not a Christian message. It could be said yeah. as an esoteric Christian message, but it's, a, it's exactly, an esoteric yeah. Islam. It's esoteric Islam, too. It's and would you say that that's a legitimate way to, to go about it? Muslim. Esoteric Islam or Gurdjieffian I, Muslim or... I would say that... Whatever, what have you. I guess we're not all esoterically inclined, but it seems like the way in... Hmm. An esoteric approach seems like the way in. To I guess like, what I'm sorry. go ahead. I guess what I'm asking is, do you do you believe you have to be Christian to have a sense of truth or Gurdjieff, connection with God? Gurdjieff would say that um, it's impossible to be Christian. Oh yeah. It's delusional hmm. unless you actually have what Jesus had, which is to know that you're a, to be conscious. Hmm. A conscious man is a more would be a moral man and wouldn't do wrong. An unconscious man, we commit evil and do evil and do all our horrible tasks in sleep and unconsciousness. Hmm. And uh, listen to philosophical sermons and go out and pretend we're loving everybody when we're only really loving our own children and yeah. those we like. And, and we only love them because they're extensions of ourselves. Right. <laughs> and when they're not, we reject them. Or others that are being nice to us and flattering us, we love them. But those yes. who don't flatter us, we don't like. The moment they stop flattering us, we right. hate them. <laughs> right. Right. And that's the more ordinary way of being. That's the more usual way of being. Hmm. And um, an inner work is to begin to see these things and uh, live your life just a little more and more consciously. Hmm. So it wouldn't matter if you call yourself Christian or, or Hindu. Philosoph philosophically light, speaking, right. it, philosophically speaking, it's sort of delusional. Yeah, it's, impo it's an impossible. It's a delus delusional, self-flattering thing from the, posi hmm. from the position, position of the work. Well, it's like yeah. identity. It's like a label. Yeah. Right. It's, it's not like really label. the substance of right. that word. The words themselves don't actually mean anything, right? You know. I mean, like as Joyce Meyer said, I can go. S I'm not a Christian just because I call myself a Christian. I mean, I can go sit in the garage and can I call myself a car? You know, because I'm sitting in the garage, you know. So, hmm. so. Um, well, the idea of, of being Christian. What? But, the, but there is a legitimacy to saying, I mean, it's very philosophical and idealistic to say it's delusional to call yourself a Christian. That's on, that's on a very philosophical level. Philosophically, you know? yeah. yeah. Like it's and a, maybe yeah. even truth level. But I think it's totally all right <laughs> if you're a member of a church to say you're a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, but, um, yeah. Cool. Well, huh. and so do you find that your Gurdjieff work, it sounds like it really fits with your, with your Swedenborgian spirituality and whatever other spirituality you have? Yeah, well, of course, um, I like Swedenborg compared to, let's say, other Christian denominations or even great Christian philosophers because... Although he is seemingly philosophizing, the man had a more actual and holistic view of the formulation and construction of man, of the human, hmm. and its relation to the different worlds. The transformation or 
construction of human. Of the human. Internal self. Internal self. And in action. And in action and in relation to the natural world, the spiritual world, and the celestial world. And our purpose and our... Mm. And there's some great philosophers, great to read and maybe even helpful, and great Christian theologians. But yeah. a lot of them are, and they're, they're all thinking from the mind and not from a true and actual understanding of the state of man, the, 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 the laws that govern the creation and the maintenance of the human being and of angels. You think that many of those writers are writing from a perspective of knowing? Of, no, of, of go ahead. They're philosophizing. Uh, with yeah. great minds and great ideas and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. new ways of thinking. Really helpful, beautiful. Yeah, uh, but when Swedenborg ideas. is talking about ways of being and our responsibilities and what could be, he's touching the place where this work actually happens hmm. Hmm. or could happen. He's illuminating and explaining it, and that's the difference between him, Swedenborgianism, and a lot of other Christian churches for me. Yeah, for Swedenborg, it seems like it's more about the internal bent of your heart and mm -hmm. transformation than it is about getting Jesus' name right. Like right. You could be, according to Swedenborg, who had mystical, or said he had mystical visions of the mm -hmm. afterlife, he saw people of all walks uh, that were heavenly, that were in heaven. Right. Right. And it, it was more about what you're saying. Right. Uh, Just and when you read them, in the Gurdjieff work, we're given a lot of exercises and efforts and um, forms. And I really can't go into them. They give you something actual to try that are, that's beyond mm -hmm. philosophy. It's, that are real and tangible and not just philosophy. And they relate to the body, the mind, and the heart. And I can see that in Sweden, and it's not given as explicitly in Swedenborg, if at all, and yet he's pointing in that same direction. He illuminates those same possibilities for me. Forms as in like tools for spiritual growth or internal growth? Like what, what Forms, can you talk generally um, about that? Forms of being related, practices, efforts, exercises of being actually related to the body, actually to the related. breath, to the energies, okay. huh. to, to what it's really about, to what's really interesting and what's really not interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, sounds, that sounds like powerful tools. Powerful. I mean, there was a gentleman that was visiting with um, in San Francisco a few weeks ago and he said, in response to a few of our questions, if you could only remove yourselves from this situation. And that was when people's spiritual questions had too much to do with their past, their pain, hmm. their challenges, as opposed to what was truly happening in the mechanism, in the machine. Another way, it is a way of talking about objectivity, of distance, but it was just beautiful. If you could only just remove yourself from the... There's a way of keeping it always about yourself that's not helpful. And I'm not talking about a selfish, I'm talking about, to, just for example's sake, worst thing in the world, you've lost a child. Incomprehensible pain. Yeah. Everyone relates, everyone's empathetic. But even in that situation, if you could remove yourself, if you could remove yourself from the story, and just see what's really happening and be more interested in what's really happening than you are in the personal challenge of the moment. Like your own narrative? Your own narrative, maybe. your own pain, how much you like or dislike what's happening. But you, often there's real pain there. It's there's tough real to work pain. through that. I mean, we yeah. have to kind of. There's real pain. Work there's that, only right? one thing worse than real pain what? Not liking the pain. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> Rejecting the pain. Hmm. Well, yeah, when we fight against pain that we can't get rid of, it tends to become worse, right? Right. Maybe. There's only one thing worse than a difficult situation, that's resenting the situation. Yeah, it's like I, 
this would be way more enjoyable if I started enjoying it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what am I interested in? Am I interested in what you've just done to me? Or am I more interested in how I'm reacting to what you've just done to me? Even more accurately, am I more interested in what I think you've just done to me? Or am I more interested in how I'm reacting to what I think you've just done to me? Or what's just mm. happened to me? You see, that's a little bit of, that's a little bit in the direction of removing myself from the situation. But it has to be, it's got to be a sincere effort. And yeah. it can't be, it's not going to be a sincere effort in the beginning. Well, in a traumatic situation, that's, that sounds really tough. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you're bored in class, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, maybe I can, that seems right. to relate for me a little bit right. closer, right? Like, but you know, I don't have to be bored in class. I can honestly say that so in my experience with alcoholism and drug addiction in my case which hmm. of which I would have died in the gutter with a needle in my arm oh. that I learned to remove myself from the situation other ways of putting it to own my part to not take it all so personally, to have made a decision to relate differently. Because everything that caused me to drink and use is still there in me. Yeah. This is a losing proposition to think that all these things that were like killing me are going to go away and I'm not going to be better until they go away. It's all about a new relation to them and to have that new relation I had to have a sincere willingness to have a new relation. Hmm. And I had this in a step change in this, because I was dying for a long time. I mean, I was d dead internally in the Old Testament way, because all that death and all, you know, you, and hand-rolling stuff was about an internal death, really. Hmm. The internal death had happened, and then the external death was happening. I'm sorry, that sounds really difficult. <laughs> well. Now it's just, like they say in AA, I'm a gratefully recovering alcoholic. Gratefully? Co gratefully recovering alcoholic because um, I don't know without all this if I would um, be where I am today. Hmm. So it's not everyone survives yeah. it though. No. So, but well, I'm digressing. What was I mean, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, that sounds blessed. Yeah, it's a, blessed, blessed. it's a blessed, blessed yeah. Thing. yeah. Not everyone wants to become for, not, for everybody, being interested in their inner work is not the most important thing in their life. The, the blessing for me is that I have this life that's centered around spiritual, centered around spiritual growth and happens to be also what I like in an ordinary way. Hmm. Like it interests me. Interesting. So it's, a little, it's just lucky, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a lucky situation. Yeah. So. Um, I'm glad you found that. Yeah. Because we, you know, we, we love you and we, uh, we appreciate hearing from you and uh, you uplifting your life and your, your perspective. It really is uh, powerful and oh, thank you. touching. I, I was talking about sort of this, this detachment or removal or taking yourself out of the equation though. And that's been, yeah. that's been, um, that's an incredibly real and possible thing. And, and I can honestly say that, as you said, it's difficult and the worst that, and the more challenging the situation, the more difficult it can seem. And yet, I can honestly tell you that in the end, it's as simple as a sincere decision. You sound like Yoda. It's like, I don't care how big that ship is, I'm just going to lift it. Right? Just, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Huh. And that's not to say that I don't get hit internally with personal subjective reaction to life. Yeah. All the time. In fact, I tend to be overly sensitive. I tend to be very defensive and sensitive and um, Me too. emotional, hmm. so to speak. Oh, yeah. None of that has changed. None of that changes. It's just my relation to it that changes. And that's as simple as a decision. In retrospect, that's as simple as a decision. But that doesn't Sincere change. decision. Well, well, defensiveness often comes out. And we, I can even or we that even, way. we even have it within, and it's this uncomfortable feeling. Often, doesn't that change as you 
as you reflect on it, as you see it? And I would say that at the same time, yes, there's a diminishment. Yeah. And yet I still experience it and act out and react in that way that can be seen externally. Yeah. But I'm f at the same time, I'm freer of it. So another thing, a great thing I heard at this weekend I was at recently was um, all these inadequacies or challenges, they're just not my concern. They're not my concern. My work is to be present to them. My work hmm. is to be present to the moment and to life and to live in both worlds, both a maybe a more gentle, peaceful world where I'm experiencing the spirit a little more and all these reactions and movements within me at the same time. Hmm. Oh. It's not, but a, like qualitative assess, a qualitative assessment and even judgment of them is not my concern. It's sure. not my business. It's none of my business. And that's another way of talking about this, removing myself from the situation. Yeah. I have some relation to all those, those traits, those moments, those, those ways of reacting to life. But that's actually not my concern. And if I can really come to know this, then something new is possible. That, that's inspiring. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, not to bring myself into it, but no, that's my reaction yeah. to it. <laughs> okay, no, no. It's, so, um, I have to admit, I feel like, you know, some moments are more real, and some moments, I feel like I'm on the, so during this interview, I feel like I'm on the soapbox, I'm pontificating, I'm more oh, real. Yeah. You know, it's very complicated, it's very, yeah. um, it's very, you have to be very, intrepid and and also very shameless to speak like I'm speaking right now in a way. Well, you know, I asked you to speak this yeah, way. Yeah, I know. So maybe I'm the shameless one. <laughs> so, um, no, well, I we appreciate it. Okay. Um, this is, you know, I think this is important to things to talk about. I mean, I feel like often in our everyday, we don't go deep with anyone's spirituality unless they're almost exactly like us already right. <laughs> or we're telling them how or we try to tell right. each other how to live yeah that's but not I think a, this is a little different that's not a strength of mine i tend to be like i tend to like the old testament with people and i can see the reactions it's terrible <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> um the cat is eating the scones just a second here oh uh, we we have this really cute cat over here and these delicious scones that you made <laughs> so you're, you're a cook you, you make delicious food consistently. I like to cook. I've, I've yes. experienced it at the, at the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I like to, I, I, particularly these days, making bread, um, naturally leavened, um, tartine, Chad Robertson style, country loaves and whole wheat loaves and other types of bread. Um, your bread is amazing. Thank you. What's your secret? <laughs> the bread is a practice for me. It's, um, Something I enjoy, I enjoy cooking, without a doubt, just simply as an ordinary way of life, I enjoy cooking, a part of life I enjoy cooking. Yeah. This bread can take anywhere from all day to a couple days if I slow it down in the refrigerator to make, and it's a, so it's a practice oh, of wow. um, giving myself to this art of making bread and seeing if what my part is in making it lighter and having a bigger crumb. Mm. Increasing the hydration, which makes it more difficult to work with, but can I still get it to work and pop up in spring and make a beautiful loaf? And so I, it's a study um, and a practice with s some level of attention. And, uh, well, and, uh, and I don't eat that practice. much bread. I mean, I, I'll keep a half a loaf around once in a while, but most of the bread I just bring it places. And mm. I use places and events as an excuse to make bread. Because I, you know, I live alone, so I'm not going to have two or three loaves of bread lying around all the time. I wouldn't be good for. Does me. the cat not live here? The cat lives here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she lives here. Yeah. Well, you're so. really. I didn't realize that there was a secret. There's. A, it's. It's a practice for you. It's. it's right. a, sounds like a wonderful hobby. Because, well, like the bread is a, a living work. thing. It's um. 
it's this combination of water, flour, salt, and natural wild yeasts, which means I don't use packaged yeast from the store. And they're affected by the temperature, the humidity, the temperature of the water I use, the quality of the flour I, that's been used that day. Um, mm. Vibrations coming through the building can affect the, the fermentation. Someone of the, told me a, a cloudy day means that it's harder to make mayonnaise. I don't know. Well, that's because of the higher humidity, I think, and the humidity can make the egg and the and the oil um, not emulsify. The egg and the oil won't emulsify correctly, I think, and with higher humidity. So is that kind of what you're talking about, the nuances of and, all, everything? Well, it's, you're working with this living organism that mm -hmm. has a mind of its own. Well, actually, living organisms, because there's a combination of bacteria and yeasts and different wild yeasts in bread making. Mm -hmm. They're affected by every aspect of the, of the moment, and so... You know, you can't will these organisms into um, cooperation. <laughs> yeah. And there's like, it's kind of like spiritual work. You know, you can have a meditation one day where you think you knew how you got somewhere, but the next day you try and get there the same way and you can't get there. Your ordinary way of doing is a, an illusion. Like, that's another premise of the Gurdjieff work. Um, man yeah. cannot do. That man has no real relation to his will. Um, in the most ordinary sense, it truly means that if I want to go to the store down the corner, it's just circumstance that got me there. I did not, and that's a simple example. I mean, it's to, as we are, circumstance allowed us to get there, hmm. let alone become president if we were a little kid who wanted to become president or, or, um, or arrive at a place in a meditation. Hmm. Well, it's kind of like Swedenborg talks about humans own like proprium like our I, the idea of self or especially like the idea that we can get things done on our own right is an illusion that that's, we demand often that's what we're talking about that's what we're, <laughs> that's talking, what we're talking about, about yeah, yeah. Well. but there is a will that we can have a relation to that actually can do a hmm. little more and i think it's and this doing and this will it's almost imaginary for me so i can only i can only begin to understand it from little experiences, but I think the ability to, going back to that um, way of looking at challenge we were talking about earlier, you know, trauma and challenge and stuff and removing ourselves from it. So when I am thrown into f defensiveness because some sales clerk or bank teller has insulted me. Hmm. Everything goes up in me, right? You know, all the movement happens and whatnot. And uh, I can s now see a choice to remember myself in that moment and not to react and not to be driven into internal or external reaction from what's happening. And I can begin to follow my breath or what, your breath? follow my follow breath, breath or um, come into relation to the sensation of my body as a conscious intentional effort as I stand there in front of you feeling insulted probably imaginarily so but feeling insulted by what's happening mm -hmm. or, or d feeling threatened by the moment is a better way to put it to me that's a, maybe a possible example of, of real doing is to be able to move my attention, the attention to my body, and become and come into a little more conscious and intentional relation to myself. That might be an example of what doing is. Hmm. And in the Christian terms, you could you could call that turning towards the Lord, maybe. Turning towards the Lord. So, so remembering yourself is synony can be synonymous with turning towards. The goddess, mm -hmm. the divinity. Allowing the Holy Spirit, making room for the Holy Spirit to arise. Hmm. Which is synonymous with the Lord? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, there's all, these are all words, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah I, I was, yeah. different ways of possibly saying the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> hmm. So, um, yeah, because this effort is about relaxing and relaxing I, I, 
There's an aspect of our lives that can be referred to as ordinary or unnecessary suffering. Again, back to this feeling threatened by our family, by our life, by our finances, feeling fear or threat by life or an actual situation. Besides a tiger, that's real. You know, a living tiger being here in front of you. But paper tigers. But of course, as humans, paper tigers are very real to us. Well, even a, a real tiger, you don't have to. You don't have to be as scared of it as you might be. No, right? you don't. Yeah, you don't. Even if it's killing you. Right. So. Easier said than done. Right? Easier said than done, but the possibility is to sacrifice this ordinary suffering. Like, again, back to alcoholism, it was an internal life of suffering. Oh, my mother did this, my brother does that, this person in front of me is doing this, the IRS is all messed up, the government shouldn't get my taxes, the da 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 you know, this internal dialogue, and, and, we, and we suffer because we... Or even if you had a fight with your husband or wife or boyfriend, you know, and you're just going over it and over it and over it again all morning because you've been hurt and betrayed. Mm. That's unnecessary suffering. We cultivate it, we water it, we fertilize it, we stick it out in the sun to grow. We, and you're saying sacrifice. So. Sacrifice is to like consciously, sacrifice. intentionally turn away from, while allowing the feelings to stay, while allowing the movement to be there, while allowing the horrible, painful explosion in the solar plexus to just continue. Hmm. We, 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 we can make a different effort. It's not about suppression, it's not about repression, it's not about denial. Okay. It's an effort to become a present to ourselves while all this is happening. So it's not about putting it under the rug. No, it's about it's... allowing it and making some other effort. Your conscious and attentional relation to your attention, it's a, it's a mechanical sleepwalking, unnecessary way to water it and fertilize it and stick it out in the sun to grow. Get, you know, I'm talking about the dialogue, the story, repeating it over and over again, cultivating it intentionally. It, that's yeah. just mechanical behavior, and yet it seems so right. Yeah, it, the, it can seem. Yeah, it's kind of how our minds work. Often, right. we just have these things going through our head all the mm -hmm. time, and we feel like that's existence. Right? That's existence, and and yeah. the, and if you've been betrayed, it couldn't be righter to plot the downfall of your betrayer. <laughs> yeah. and grow your self-pity with what they've done to you. Often, yeah. That's how we feel. But um, to sacrifice is to make holy. That's what the word to sacrifice means, to make holy. Oh, really? So you take the mm. sacrifice and you return to your breath, or you turn to a prayer. When I say return to a prayer, what I truly mean is really, sincerely turn to the prayer. Turn to a prayer to say it with depth and feeling and meaning the whole time this turmoil is going on. Hmm. Not begging, pleading, not wishing, you know, for relief, not in hope and saying the prayer, the situation will change. Oh, no, stop this. Oh, God, stop it. Oh, I don't know. You know, I'll do anything. Or even some lovely, Our Father who art in heaven, help me in the name of the kingdom come, that will be done. Hmm. But our Father who art in heaven and feeling the pull back to the unnecessary suffering but keeping your attention on the prayer as a willing effort and you might find three phrases into the prayer you're completely back in the suffering hmm. you start over again it's almost like you're like you lean into peace or you find peace you lean into peace yes you know in, in every moment right hopefully of course, 99, I talk a big talk here, but I don't want, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm over there watering that pot and sticking out in the sun to, to flourish and keep me asleep. It's a process. So it's a process, yeah. Oh. But I think she wants to say hello to us. I, I think she's, she a, she's a camera, she is a, um, I think she um, knows there's a camera or something around here. So she's pretty. Um, Very kind yeah, cat. So she's, she's a named. good cat. Yeah. 
I like to flatter myself and say like 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 master like companion or like you know like human like pet. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I flatter myself with my pets too. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves my dog. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if it's true that it's because she emulates me. Right. <laughs> Be the, be the be the owner of your pet, you know, what's it? Be the owner of your pet thinks you are. Well, I think pets are yeah. kind of a good, well, you know, they can, we can project all kinds of things onto pets right. and treat them in mm -hmm. a lot of different ways. I mean, even calling them pets, some people may have right. an issue with or having pets, but I find that it's a good, it's a good locus mm -hmm. point for growth, Right. <laughs> having pets around, Yeah. you know. I couldn't imagine living in um, my home without a living, another living creature. Oh yeah. Have you always probably better a cat than a person? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's often true yeah. for most of us. Right. <laughs> so. How's uh, have you always had a cat? I've had cats for thirty years. Yeah, thirty or so years. Always, I like this breed a lot. They're very, they're the Persian, the one with the mean, flat face. People always kind of joke, oh, they look so mean. They're actually the very loving. Oh. Good, kind cats, yeah. Mm. So looks can be deceiving. Yeah, looks can be deceiving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially on this plane, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, that, I don't know, it's kind of associative here, but it brings up a... Um, yeah, what we think about other people, and all, again, this unnecessary suffering and these stories we tell and these thought processes we go through. I had a sort of an ongoing battle with a stepmother for 20 or... 30 years until I got sober and then um, when my behavior improved our relationship improved fancy that huh, huh yeah and, uh, <laughs> she stopped being such a terrible person once well, no, just, uh, actually, you know, uh, you know I wrote, paradoxically she um, <laughs> in her actual wish to continue being terrible she told me after a few drinks god you're so nice when you're clean and sober you know mm. meaning like she wished she could still be battling with me but well, often we blame the other person, like she's a right, terrible person, right. but it was oh. like always us. Well, it was always, <laughs> yeah, I agree. And um, she got sick, and in my opinion from the outside, really had no f faith to rely on, and her last time was very challenging for her, oh. you know. I'm sorry. And I realized, I don't know if I realized it enough to, be different in the next situation when it's offered me, but I realized that, I want to say this rightly, it was such a waste of my time and energy to battle her so, because she actually probably was the way I saw her, manipulative, conniving, disingenuous, malevolent, Oh yeah. but she was going to always pay the price for that. I want to be very clear here. Not that paying the price for that makes me feel good, like she got what she deserved. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like, but I'm saying justice is the Lord's, and people and, and justice will justice will arrive. It's not my concern. Mm. When I come upon a person who is incredibly challenging, I need to remember that. Be compassionate and remember that justice or righteousness or whatever is not my concern. That the compassion for them in the moment and for the situation is such a better place to be because even if I'm right, it's gonna, you know, they'll get their own and it's, it's sad. It may be sad. Does that make sense to you? It made me, when I realized the the greatness of the situation, like, wow, I spent all that time fighting her when it would have been better for everyone, myself included, to have been compassionate and understanding. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Because in the end, it was very painful for her because of she actually had all these ways I thought she had, and those ways lead to a bad end, lead to a, to a, a lot of suffering. You think that kind of her modality of, of living um, like helped what cause cause their illness or well no nothing like that 
I mean, she had nothing to rely on. There was a lot of emotional pain and struggle in the end. Oh, I see. She had a type of cancer, and she was with us for about a year, and there was an incredibly large amount of demons surfaced and were in great evidence, and the pain and unhappiness and unpeaceful end was very evident. Oh all very consistent with the types of behaviors that I had seen in her. But it doesn't matter if they validated it or not. What I saw was, wow, you really need to be compassionate with someone when they're experiencing it earlier because the end, you know, the, the justice or whatever, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Yeah, there's, like, there's a, a type of karma to everything. In there's a sense. Type, right. And, I, and the revelation I got was not that, oh, she's going to get her own, so I didn't have to worry about it. That's not what I'm saying. And maybe karma is the wrong word. No, no, that. it's okay. It's, 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 it's legitimate. It's, this is karma we're talking about. Okay. But that it's not my concern. My concern is to make everyone's journey as nice as possible. Yeah. Because I'm all like, she's up in my face. This is unjust. I have to fight back and make her life more painful. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's not helping anyone. It's not helping anyone, myself especially. And she and definitely, I, she probably won't learn from that situation either. Right. For her own transformational right. benefit. And I got this incredible impression from the so sorrow that I felt from the end of her life about th this. But, you know, hopefully I'll learn from that impression. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I haven't had the same opportunity to, um, you know, be compassionate towards somebody. Well, you're aware of it. That's the and first I'm more step. aware of it, yeah. <laughs> of the, possi you of the possibility. <laughs> yeah. The possibility. The possibility, yeah. right. So. Well, when hopefully, you know, did, it, did she seem to learn from... You said you were sitting with her and she's like, you're so nice now or, or whatever. Yeah, this was before she got sick, but she, she liked her drinks. And um, after a drink or two, she'd say sort of, facetiously you're so nice I can't fight with you anymore I'm being forced to be nice to you it won't look good <laughs> oh really yeah oh. so no I don't think she learned but um there's know. some type of I don't know that maybe there's some huh. yeah at least she was nice to you I mean, yeah she was so. she was well she was she was showering me with gifts and kindnesses in the last years of her life before she got sick because um she could no longer fight me because I wasn't creating a reason to fight. Okay. So, but um, I'm sure there, there. It sounds like there has to be like growth and learning there, maybe. Yeah. Right. Well, well yeah. I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. It's hard to know. I'm not sure. She seemed the same to me for her oh, whole right. life. Oh, yeah. But you know, some people have ways of reacting, responding to life that they just are not never free of. Well, you know, yeah. if, if part of the reason she was behaving like that earlier on was kind of your dynamic. Our dynamic, right. You know, later when that changed and she wasn't acting that way, I mean, right. maybe it was kind of revelatory for, you know, she's not naturally okay. just always, you know. I know, I think she... Like it's always a relationship. But. I think she saw a new possibility in my changes. Oh, yeah. I don't huh. want to sound too egocentric, but I mean, yeah. I think there was a little bit of like, oh... You're no longer like that. Maybe something else is possible for oh, all of us. That's cool. Huh? <laughs> that's cool. But her fears and compulsions were very strong. Yes, like uh, many of ours. Like many of ours. Like yeah. my, my own included. <laughs> yeah, ours, ours, our, our own included. Well, well. One of the great things about the work that is different than um, belonging to a church or other Christian communities is the ones I know of, I mean, the ones I'm familiar with, sure. in general, is that, so this very thing, responding to the unpleasant manifestations of others. Mm -hmm. So in the Gurdjieff work, we have whole days where we work together, or whole weeks in the summer, or just evenings during the week when we're together and whatnot. And one of the things is when we're making these efforts to be present to ourselves, 
while doing ordinary tasks, well, we sit together, meditate together, do sacred dance together, um, exchange in quiet groups together, and do things like cooking and cleaning and carpentry and um, other crafts together. And we're all human, and we all have unpleasant manifestations. Mm. We all know that learning from and working with and struggling with our internal um, reactions to the manifestations of others is what we're doing together. So knowing that, when you're with each other, you're being given opportunities when someone's being unpleasant. Well, when you think, I like that. When, you, when you're perceiving that someone's being unpleasant to you or someone has a difficult manifestation or personality trait, we're all together in a situation where you know those are moments of opportunity. So, and there's a lot of different kinds of people there. Some is some of the most annoying people you've ever met, even in the work. But you all know on a conscious level that these are opportunities. And so, whereas at church, if someone gets a little too snippy, maybe even the minister will talk to them and say, "Oh, you were a little too snippy to to, to little Georgie Poo over there yesterday. Um, maybe you should go apologize." None of that in the work, because we all know that we're there working with the unpleasant manifestations of each other. Because you uplift the idea that. These are opportunities for transformation and growth. Right. So it's challenging. It's not for everybody, of course, because that's a, that's a hard. And then, since work is in life, we take this into life, hopefully, and do it with the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, and our friends and family. Hopefully, we're trying this stuff with them, too. Well, thank you for, for sharing uh, your perspective. OK. Yeah. <laughs> no, really. It's, it's been wonderful. <laughs> I, I want to, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we, we close? Goodbye, everyone, and thanks for listening. Oh, goodbye, and uh, tune in next time to another Transcendence podcast.